Good afternoon. My name is Mike Langston, and I am the um, acting director at the South Central Climate Science Center in Norman, Oklahoma. And you are joining the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo webinar that is in preparation or introduction to our forum, which is coming up in a month. Um, today we have a special treat. We have two researchers who have been working on this uh, Rio Grande, Rio Bravo um, project for more than um, two years now. It's two and a half years now, if I remember right. Um, we have both Sophie Tussin, who is um, a postdoc working on this project, and the PI for this project, Jennifer Koch. Uh, Sophie is, a, uh, is new to the United States. She's been here about seven months. She comes to us via Bordeaux, France. So we hope that you all um, enjoy this presentation. As you can see on the screen, it is sponsored by multiple groups including the good folks at the World Wildlife Fund who have set up the WebEx for us. So our thanks to them. Um, with that introduction, I'm going to let Sophie take over. Sophie? Okay, thank you. Uh, um, good afternoon. So I will uh, present uh, the advent of our project, uh, which is more than just Sophie? Sophie, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, we're not seeing your um, screen. Are you oh, sharing it? My fault. Okay. It's my fault. Uh, right. No, it's not. That is my fault. I'm going to correct that right now. Hang on. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Uh, and Sarah, is it possible to mute people on the line? I'm hearing some feedback. Sure. I'm doing that right now. Thank you. Well, that's great. I tried that. Oh, yeah. I'll put that on there. There we go. Sarah, can you see that? Um, Introductory slide? No. It, it turned gr Oh, there you go. Now I can see it, yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's my fault. <laughs> so, Thank you. No problem. Uh, so I, can't, I can't Wait, access then. the web link. Okay. So the title of the presentation is Modeling Water and River Management Strategies in the Rio Grande Bravo Basin. Uh, so this is a work laid by uh, Jennifer Koch of uh, IT. And um, I prepared this presentation with uh, Kelly Vache, who is an uh, assistant professor in Oregon State University, uh, and uh, Kindra Hansen, who is a graduate student uh, at the Department of Geography and environmental sustainability. Uh, the results uh, I will present have been also uh, built in collaboration with uh, Jack Hoffman and uh, Stephanie Palladino. So first of all, I will uh, give you an overview about the Rio Grande Bravo Basin. Um, so from an ecological point of view, uh, this is a large watershed which covers an area of 552,000 square kilometers. This is the fifth long, longest river in North America uh, that crosses a high diversity of climate, uh, from high mountainous um, uh, climate at the headwater, uh, through arid and semi-arid climate, to subtropical climate close to the mouth. Uh, this river cross also a high diversity of ecosystem, uh, as we can see uh, uh, on the map on the left side. Uh, so we have more than 10 uh, ecoregions. But what we have to remember is that uh, the Chihuahua Desert uh, covers around 50% of the basin. Uh, so this is a basin that is dominated by arid and semi-arid uh, ecosystems. Uh, so this uh, has an implication uh, in terms of uh, water availability for the people. Uh, so if we at scale and compare uh, the Rio Grande Basin with other international rivers, 
uh, we can see that it is one of the most uh, water scarce uh, basin in the world uh, with um, uh, availability of water between zero and 500 uh, cubic meters per person and per year, uh, which is under uh, water stress uh, threshold. Uh, from a social point of view, so this river crosses uh, several political boundaries. Uh, so two countries, U.S. and Mexico, but also eight states. So uh, three states in the United States and five states in uh, Mexico. Uh, and because of this uh, low availability of water, uh, so several bi-national and interstate agreements uh, have been uh, established uh, between the state and the country in order to uh, regulate and share the water. Uh, in terms of uh, water use, uh, so in the basin, um, so this data comes from USGS and, uh, uh, and the CNA uh, from Mexico. So agriculture is the main uh, consumer of both ground and the surface water, uh, followed by the public supply. And uh, this is interesting to compare. Oh, I cannot. Uh, okay. Sorry. Um, okay. It's not your Okay. Sorry. And so <laughs> this is interesting to compare the water withdrawal with the land cover uh, of the basin. So most of the basin is dominated by shrubland and grassland and forest, so uh, mainly natural vegetation. And agriculture covers 3.5% of the basin, uh, but consume an estimated 90% of the total surface water withdrawal. Another thing we have to know about the Rio Grande is that the stream flow are, are highly controlled by humans. Uh, so here this is another map uh, showing the dam's uh, density uh, for the international river. Uh, so we can see uh, the Rio Grande as a high density. And this dam, uh, like uh, Elephant Butte Dam, uh, has been built in order to uh, control the flood, uh, but also to fulfill the different uh, interstate and uh, binational agreements. Um, uh, so the Rio Grande, uh, the flow regime in the Rio Grande uh, are characterized by uh, high spatial and temporal variation. So here we have the map uh, showing uh, different gauges and, uh, on the left, and on the right, um, the annual average uh, flow uh, in cubic meter per second, and uh, the minimum and maximum value uh, for a long time period, uh, so um, according to the data from uh, the 70 to 2016. And what we can see, um, I cannot choose my, my oh, yeah, um, is that so at Hotowi Gauge, which is uh, located uh, between uh, Colorado and Mexico, so the flow are on annual average of 40 but they will decrease um, progressively and will be strongly deplete, depleted in uh, Form Kitman, which is uh, where it's located the uh, Forgotten Ridge. Uh, then they will increase uh, because of the confluence with the Rio Conchos. Uh, they will also increase below Amistad because uh, of the um, confluence with the Pecos River and uh, finally decrease uh, close to the most. And what we can see also is that we have a spatial variation, but we have also a time variation. So here, this is a value, uh, minimum value uh, between uh, 71 and uh, 2011. So close to the move, we can see that the minimum value has been uh, one uh, cubic meter per second to 100 uh, cubic meter per second. Uh, the Rio Grande, um, uh, also has a major environmental issues. Uh, so it has been classified as one of the most endangered rivers in the world because of over allocation of water, but also because of alteration of riparian and eco aquatic ecosystems that are critical habitats for endangered species, such as the southwestern willow flycatcher and the Rio Grande silvery minnow. 
because also of a modification of sediment distribution uh, due to changes in flow regime and invasion of uh, exotic riparian vegetation. So in the photo, um, in the bottom, we can see prescribed the fire uh, to control the giant cane. And also because of the degradation of the water quality with an increase of salinity, bacteria, nutrients, and heavy metals. Uh, so with special uh, variation in the basin. Uh, so now I will uh, describe the motivation of our study. Uh, so the Rio Grande de Bravo Basin will have to face uh, two major challenges in the next year. Uh, the, west, the first one is the population growth. Uh, which is expected to double, and this will uh, lead to an increase of water demand, and so uh, probably an increase of water withdrawal. Uh, but also, despite, despite the uncertainties, uh, climate is expected to change, and this will have a major impact, uh, both in terms of quantity with a reduction of surface water inflow, uh, due probably to a reduction of um, of a snowpack, uh, but also um, change in terms of um, that will increase the variability, uh, both temporal and spatial. And this uh, will um, generate an increase, uh, decrease in the water supply for the population. Uh, so those uh, challenges uh, motivated the research question for uh, our modeling uh, research, which is uh, how may water use and land use management strategies affect the basin under distinct scenario of climate change and population growth. Uh, so the objective we have in this project is first to construct a spatially explicit agent-based model of the basin uh, in order to understand how regional decision-making and behavior affect and is affected by dynamics at the basin level, and explore alternative future system responses resulting from different management strategies under changing social and natural conditions. Uh, so now I will present the method that the team has followed uh, for the model, for to build the model, and how uh, from uh, the river uh, that we frame as a system, we draw a conceptual model uh, and uh, that we use for simulation purposes. Uh, so the first important thing uh, to know is that we draw, uh, we build this model based on an interdisciplinary collaboration between social and natural scientists, uh, because we consider that the complex, complex problems the Rio Grande has to face needs uh, skills and knowledge from uh, different disciplines. And we also want to integrate uh, the complexity of the human decision making in this model. Uh, combining qualitative data with pre-existing uh, quantitative databases. Uh, so we use data and uh, knowledge from uh, three disciplines in this project, so hydrology, geography, but also anthropology. And uh, the modeler has been uh, playing the role of facilitator to integrate uh, this data. Uh, we use the modeling framework InVision, so what is Envision? Uh, this is an integrated modeling platform uh, that is used uh, to analyze human natural system dynamics. Uh, so in the graphic below, you have a representation. Uh, so this is a special, uh, so we have a multi-agent component and a landscape component. Uh, so the landscape component is a geographic information system-based tool. Uh, where we locate uh, agents that make decisions uh, in terms of water use, but also land use. So this platform has been, uh, has been developed by Oregon State University, and uh, if you want to have more information, you have the website here. Uh, so in the specific case of the Rio Grande, uh, we implement uh, three subcomponents. Actually, we have an hydrologic model, a landscape model, and, and a multi-agent model. So for the hydrologic model, we use a climate input data set uh, to represent the evolution of the stream flow of the river, but also the evapotranspiration of the vegetation. And we also include the rules of the main reservoir. For the landscape model, we use a geographic information uh, system data. Um, 
so I will detail later, and uh, we represent the evolution of the vegetation based on the state and transition model. And for the actors, so we represent the human decision making related to water resource management and land use uh, based on interview and census data. So then we implement the scenario uh, for a long time period of 50 years. So we decided to uh, represent three kinds of scenario, climate change, population growth, but also new strategies in terms of land use and water use. And we assess uh, several metrics. So um, we've envisioned, we are uh, envisioned, uh, give us the flexibility to choose the metric but we decided here to look at the stream flow, water consumption, land use change, and social and economic metrics. Um, so we use, the, as I explained earlier, qualitative data. Um, so this uh, information uh, has been collected by uh, environmental anthropologists, so Jack Freeman and uh, Stephanie Palladino, that uh, conducted several qualitative interviews with uh, stakeholders. So how do we integrate this data? Uh, we um, organize several whole group research meetings, uh, so based on an intensive collaboration uh, during one year. And we are, um, and we are, um, uh, uh, <laughs> and we have <laughs> uh, creating several sub products. So the first one is a concept map. So I will show you later. So this is a cognitive map uh, that we use in order to uh, map the perception of the stakeholders about ecological and social dynamics. Uh, then another sub-product is a text analysis. So this is a computational uh, analysis of the text uh, that counts the word frequency and proximity. So we run this uh, text analysis on the transcript of the interview. Uh, but uh, we don't have access uh, to, to, the, to the name of the person. This is anonymous. And the objective is to compare this result with the concept map um, in order to uh, complement the conceptual model development. And finally, uh, we built uh, with the anthropologist uh, an actor typology uh, based on the similar strategies uh, regarding water and land use management. Uh, so we do that to document the strategy uh, we will uh, simulate in the model. Uh, so we want to know what uh, the different actors are doing and also uh, the differences between the region. Um, and also identify the possible uh, adaptation of uh, these actors. So I will present uh, later. So then we combine this qualitative data with the pre-existing data. So I will... Uh, present quickly. Uh, so for the hydrologic uh, model, we use a digital elevation model, so the elevation of the basin in order to delineate the stream network. Uh, we also use uh, historic data about the stream, stream flow uh, at different gauges, so from IBWC and USGS. Uh, we also use data about the main uh, reservoir in the basin. Uh, we also use data, collected data about the canals, the diversion points, and the project diversion, uh, such as the uh, SGCP, which is the San Juan Chama project. And we also uh, use as input a climate uh, data set, uh, so, which are uh, precipitation and temperature, minimum and maximum, uh, for a long time period. For the landscape, uh, we use uh, so the following uh, data sets. So we have the land cover and land use. Uh, we also use the land ownership. Uh, so this is important uh, to locate the actors. Then we use the political uh, boundary, so the counties, the uh, state, uh, countries, and the boundary also of the irrigation district. For the actor, uh, we collected data about the water use. Uh, so for U.S. at the county level and for Rio Bravo at, uh, for the Mexican side at the watershed level. And for the scenario, um, we will use uh, future climate uh, projection uh, from local data sets. And um, so 
this data doesn't exist, but we will build a regression model to represent uh, the population group. Uh, so now I will present uh, the preliminary results. So this is an ongoing research. Uh, we have uh, one more year to finalize. Um, so here I will present uh, results both uh, about the conceptual model development and uh, some example of uh, simulation output. Uh, so first I will present the concept map uh, I uh, explained earlier. So this is the concept map uh, we drew with the anthropologist. So this is a little bit complex. I won't uh, describe all the relationship, but I will give a, a big overview. Uh, so the different boxes uh, represent the different topics uh, that have been brought up during the interview. And so we categorized uh, into different uh, so, uh, related ecosystems. Uh, related ecosystem uh, for green, hydrology for blue, uh, human, environmental, and mixed. And between these different uh, boxes, we have arrow, uh, so that uh, represents the relationship between uh, these uh, components. Uh, so these arrows, they have a directionality, uh, but they have also uh, an influence, so they can be positive. Uh, so, for example, we have here uh, okay. the rainfall. So, um, when the quantity of rainfall increases, uh, we increase the risk of uh, flash flooding. So, this is for a positive relationship, but we also can have negative relationship. So, when the more we have human control, uh, less we have invasive uh, plant species. So, why we did that? Uh, this uh, picture, they don't show how uh, the system works. Uh, this picture aims at uh, representing uh, from the interview uh, how the stakeholders uh, perceive their batting. And uh, we use uh, this uh, concept map in order to uh, help us understand the perception of the people about the batting, but also to choose uh, some consistent uh, metrics uh, we would like to, um, to assess in the model. Uh, so this uh, concept map, we can uh, extract uh, several quantitative indicators. Uh, so here is a table uh, summarizing these indicators. Uh, so we have uh, 37 components uh, related by 86 uh, connections. Uh, then we can define if uh, these components are a, a driver, uh, meaning that they influence other components of the system. So for example, the human control or if they are a receiver, meaning that they are influenced by other components of the system, but they don't influence other components. So for example, endangered species. And then we have uh, ordinary components, uh, so they are both influenced and they also influence other components of the system. And we can also measure some metric, uh, like uh, the density. Uh, so this represents the portion of pot the percentage of the potential uh, connection that are actual connection, and the complexity score, uh, so which is uh, quite uh, high and uh, confirm uh, our hypothesis about the batting. So this is the first uh, uh, pro sub product. The second sub product I will uh, present is an example uh, of results from the text analysis. Uh, so this uh, result um, uh, comes from uh, the text analysis that has been run uh, for a test uh, document. It has not been run for all the transcripts of the interview. Uh, so in the left side, we have uh, the topic, um, the different topics that have been uh, identified by the text analysis. Uh, so this bubble, uh, the red bubble, indicates that we have a, a bag of four words that made the topic risk, region, irrigation, and run. And in the right side, we have the uh, most relevant term um, that have been cited for uh, this topic. So for uh, this topic, risk, region, irrigation, and run, uh, the Example of a term that have been uh, most cited are border, security, farm, and channel. Uh, so we use this text analysis in order to complement uh, the concept map 
and uh, see uh, if uh, 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 there are possible uh, topics that have been discussed during the interview uh, that, um, that didn't appear when we draw, drew the concept map with the anthropology. Uh, the third result I will present is the actor uh, typology. Uh, so here I uh, show again our framework. So uh, this actor typology we use to, uh, for our multi-agent model. Um, so we built uh, this uh, typology with the, hydrolo with the anthropologist. And what I want to highlight here is this this is a simple uh, typology. We don't represent all the actors of the system because then it's too hard to, to simulate. Um, so the first group we have are all the water user and landscape uh, manager. Uh, so the first uh, actor here is, uh, are the farmers. So they are, as we saw before, are the main consumer of water. Uh, then we have the urban uh, planner. So they make decisions for um, uh, what are used in the city. Then we have the public NGO and land manager, uh, such as the Bureau of Land Management on National and State Park. So these actors, they don't withdraw water, but uh, they manage big areas of land, so they have an impact on the surface water runoff. Then we have the tribe. So the tribe, they use few water, but they have the priority. And finally, the recreation uh, river tour operator. So they don't withdraw water, but uh, they need minimum flow uh, for their activity. Uh, then we identified another group, um, so the water distribution organization. So they distribute the water uh, for the people they, uh, that use. So inside, we include irrigation district, ditch company, and the Asekia or irrigation unit, which are small scale uh, farmer association. And finally, uh, all uh, the actors that need water, uh, they will uh, request to the water or dam authority, uh, which will uh, store or release the water uh, according to annual uh, inflow projection and also to fulfill the different agreements. So all these actors are located in our landscape as you can see uh, with this animation. Uh, so then this is a, a work in progress, so I will give you just some examples. But for each of these sectors, uh, we uh, defined the, the strategy we will uh, implement in the model. So here are some examples of factors, and here in the middle, some examples of the strategy we represent. So these strategies are uh, related to the land use and the water management. So, for example, the farmer will um, uh, have decisions related to the crop choice or the irrigation technology. Uh, the urban planners, they will have a strategy in terms of uh, water price and the source of water they use. And what we are doing with the anthropologist is uh, defining possible adaptation um, of uh, the management, uh, current possible adaptation, but also for the future in order to uh, integrate uh, this adaptation in uh, the future scenario. So for the crop choice, for example, it would be to increase uh, the use of draw tolerant crops. Um, for the irrigation technology, it would be to uh, improve the equipment. Uh, for the price, it would be to increase the price and the water source to lease the surface water from farmers. So this is an uh, example, uh, so we will uh, keep working and uh, integrate this, this different strategy in the model. The four uh, uh, results I wanted to show you is the spatial environment of the model. Uh, so just to remember our framework, so this is uh, here, uh, what kind of data we integrate in the landscape, for, uh, to represent the landscape, sorry. Uh, so here um, I show the different uh, layer we used. So we have the watershed and the stream network and the land cover to represent the ecological data that we uh, intersect also with uh, more social uh, uh, data. So the boundary of the county, but also the data about the land ownership. 
and in order to uh, build a spatial environment of our model. So we'll make a, a zoom. So here, uh, this is a zoom of the spatial environment. Uh, so each polygon represents a landscape unit, and uh, for each of these polygons, uh, we uh, locate our different actors I presented uh, earlier. Uh, so for example, uh, the first one here, this is a polygon uh, located on a cultivated area, so it's managed by a farmer. This polygon in uh, uh, red is an artificial area, so this is managed by a urban planner. And so, um, uh, based on the intersection of these different layers, we uh, obtain uh, 75,000 uh, landscape units uh, where we will locate uh, the actors. So regarding the spatial environment, I also highlighted uh, here uh, that um, in the lower Rio Grande Valley, so close to the Moose, on the U.S. side, uh, we have a EDAC to uh, delineate the boundary of the system. So in blue here, you have the catchment uh, boundary of the system. Okay, sorry. And uh, so this is the catchment boundary. Uh, here the river. Uh, here this is the irrigation district uh, in uh, uh, red. And in uh, yellow, this is uh, three counties. So this irrigation unit and uh, these counties are not located in the basin. However, they use uh, the surface water from the Rio Grande uh, for, their, uh, for agriculture and uh, domestic purposes. Uh, so from an hydrologic point of view, uh, we, will we could consider this area uh, not in the system and um, as an external factor. But as this is a very heavy consumer of water, uh, so we decided to uh, include this area uh, in the model, and so to increase the spatial extent of our uh, of our uh, boundary. Uh, so finally, I will uh, show you how uh, some different uh, aspects of the hydrologic model. Uh, so just to remember the framework. So this is the data we use for the hydrologic model, okay? Um, so for the hydrologic uh, model, we use an InVision extension, which is a flow uh, plugin. So this is a semi-distributed model, and uh, it provides a flexible uh, framework uh, for representing the main hydrologic uh, processes in the basin. Uh, so it uh, includes rainfall and runoff. Uh, but also um, some uh, data management about the reservoir operation and uh, agricultural irrigation. So as we can see in these two maps, uh, so the flow model provides uh, also a geometric representation of the streams and the catchment. Uh, so here we have a graphic explaining how the hydrologic processes are simulated uh, with this uh, flow model. Um, so we have on the left the precipitation, um, uh, and on the so this is the input uh, data. So we use the climate data for that. And on the left uh, right uh, left uh, right side, we have the two outputs: the evapotranspiration and the runoff. And here uh, an explanation about the different uh, processes. Uh, so from snowpack, uh, the water in the soil and also the different um, relationship uh, between uh, the shallow and deep uh, groundwater. Uh, so these different uh, processes happen in uh, HRU, which are hydrological responses units. Uh, so they are also uh, located in the landscape. So I will show another graph. Uh, so for each HRU located in the landscape, we represent uh, this hydrological uh, processes. And then these uh, different uh, HRU are assembled into catchments uh, where uh, the water uh, will run off into a single uh, drainage point. And then the flow model will uh, manage the hydrological connectivity between the rich the witches and uh, this catchment. Uh, 
Uh, so here I will try to show you. Uh, oops, sorry. So there is an animation, but I don't know if it's working. Oh yeah, okay, cool. Uh, so this is an animation from uh, in the Invision platform. What we are seeing here. So this is the batting. And uh, we are seeing the evolution of the climate uh, temperature, so, uh, so with, uh, on a daily basis uh, for the year uh, 93. Uh, so as we can see, this is uh, spatially explicit, so we don't have the same temperature in the north and in the south of the basin. So this data is used uh, uh, to, uh, for the main to represent the main hydrological processes. So here it was the temperature, and here we have the precipitation. Um, so, okay. So here this is the example of output we can uh, extract from the model. Uh, so this is not the final uh, output, this is just to uh, give you some examples. So on the left side, uh, we have um, uh, the stream flow at different, uh, gauge, uh, at different gauges. Uh, so the, the black uh, line represents the output of the model, and the um, blue line uh, represents the historic data uh, for the year uh, 93, I think. And so here we have the time, so the days along the year, and the, here so the value of the stream flow. Uh, so there is a difference here, and this is normal because in this stage of the model development, we just represented the uh, natural flow without integrating the evapotranspiration, so the use of water by the vegetation, and also uh, the reservoir operation. So this is normal but we will uh, adjust that in the next uh, step. Uh, we can also, uh, from InVision, have some output about uh, climate. So here we have the precipitation. And here, um, so that represents different uh, uh, layer of uh, water content. But this is just example I want to describe. Okay. Uh, so to conclude, uh, I will present the next step of our research and the first implication. Um, so in terms of uh, simulation, uh, the next step is to integrate the three components of the model I presented today, so the hydrological model, the landscape model, and the actor strategies, uh, in order to um, uh, assess the different uh, metrics. Uh, then we will calibrate the model with the historic data, uh, and then implement the scenarios and the future projections. Uh, the implication of our research, um, so what we learned <laughs> from this um, uh, first month is that modeling the whole Rio Grande Bravo basin as a copolumen natural system is not straightforward. Why? Uh, because first, uh, the study of the fine resolution is uh, very difficult because of the spatial extent. Uh, so as I presented at the beginning, is uh, five uh, 500,000 square kilometers, uh, so this is the size of the big country of Europe. And then uh, we uh, observe a spatial mismatch uh, between the watershed boundary, uh, so where, is, where the water run off, and the use of oops, and the use of water. Uh, so where is the real boundary of the system? Uh, so then the binational nature of, the, of this system uh, encouraged to use international data because they are more uh, homogeneous between the two countries. However, they are not always detailed or available. Uh, so then we have to use national data, what we have done. But the problem is that sometimes they are inconsistent and that uh, need uh, more uh, pre-processing, so this is uh, more time consuming. Then we uh, met several difficulties to access some data. Uh, so for example, uh, I give some example here about the water use and the climate data at high resolution in uh, Mexico. And uh, then there are uh, several uh, challenges that we think it's will be very interesting to integrate in the model, but for this 
first draft version, maybe for this first version, uh, maybe um, it will be too hard, which is to model the individual surface water right, both for US and Mexico, and also the interaction between the surface and groundwater at the wall basin level. Another implication is that um, uh, the integrated modeling uh, through interdisciplinary collaboration so improves the conceptualization of the, of the complex system. But uh, converting qualitative data into a quantitative form remains a challenge. And the willingness of the team is very determining, but it's true that in this project we were lucky because the uh, anthropologists were very uh, willing to uh, develop the model with us. Um, finally, the implication of the research for water management. So the model research is ongoing. It's too early to draw conclusion uh, from the simulation, but we expect to communicate and discuss the simulation results with the research community and stakeholders, both in US and Mexico, in the next step. Uh, so thank you, gracias. <laughs> Uh, so here we have some uh, references uh, so we use for um, this presentation. And uh, here are uh, the different contacts of the person if you need to know more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. That was very good. Um, questions? Who has a question for Sophie? Um, Sarah, can you unmute? Can you do the global unmute for us, please? <coughs> Yes, I just unmuted everybody. So you're all unmuted now, so this is dangerous. So if you have a question, <laughs> please go ahead and ask it. <clears throat> Hi, Sophie. Here is Jed. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 All right. Um, what is the time series uh, of your data that you are using for the modeling? I don't know if I missed it at the beginning. Um, so for uh, calibration, the climate data we use is uh, from 19 to 2013. Um, then uh, for the land use, uh, so we don't have data, yearly data for all this year. Um, maybe I can come back. Uh, uh, for the land, okay, sorry. Um, so for the land use, uh, for uh, Mexico and U.S., we use uh, 2011. Uh, this is the uh, special data we have. Um, okay. Okay. So here's the climate data. We use a six-kilometer resolution uh, from 90 to 2013. The stream flow and the gauge observation, so we have the data. It depends on the gauges also, right? because we will have to uh, calibrate the model with uh, several gauges. But uh, we also have uh, daily data for uh, this time period. Uh, then for, uh, for the land use, so this is uh, more uh, complex. For the land cover, we have uh, the year of 2010. And for the land use, so for the, Mex uh, for the U.S. <coughs> side, we have yearly data uh, from 2008 to 2016. But for Mexico, we only have the 2007. Uh, so then the land ownership, this is uh, not uh, climate data. This is more the climate data, actually, and the land use. Chad, did that answer your question? Yes, so some, some of the data is time series and some are data points, right? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Other questions? Hear me? Yes. I was wondering in the concept diagram, it looked like um, rainfall had a negative effect on irrigation, and that didn't make sense to me. Did I misunderstand something? So let me. Um, chime in here, Jennifer Koch speaking. So what we want to make sure about the concept map is that this is not a description of how the system works from a biophysical point of view. So this is a filter um, that the environmental anthropologists 
uh, provided, and it's a description of what they heard in their interviews, people talking about how they perceive how the system works. So that doesn't mean that everything that's in there is correct, and this doesn't mean that this has to be complete. This is just a, a visual representation of the interviews and the data that was collected during the interviews. Does that answer your question? Uh, sort of. I, what, in the interviews, what was there? Why did they believe that rainfall had a negative effect on irrigation? So that is detailed, and that will be represented in the transcript. But um, so we are not able to access the transcript, just to make that clear. Okay, so this is not um, on our computers. We don't have access to the transcript data. So this is just what we heard the anthropologists report. So, um, may I make so if you talk to them, they can definitely tell you more about what the context of that conversation was when that came up. It's logical to assume that. It's logical to assume that increased rainfall causes a decrease in the need or use of irrigation, and that may be the reason that there's a negative relationship. That's speculation on my part. Yeah, and so we also have we developed that in the mental modeler software, and for each of those boxes and relationships, we also have relatively detailed notes, and we try to to um, yeah <coughs> take note of all the important topics that came up in our conversation there. So this is just a screenshot of the diagram, so that's, that's just part of the of the model that we developed. This is Greg Koch with Coca-Cola. Um, you, you write at the bottom of one of the slides that you, in this first version, you haven't modeled aquifers, groundwater. Do you propose to do that, and more importantly, how? <laughs> no, so I just put here that uh, also data we collected, but we didn't integrate in the first version of the model uh, because this is a very uh, complex and we have um, two year projects, so we decided um, uh, not to integrate in this first uh, version of the model. So here I put other special data gathered but not integrated, aquifer wells and uh, water rights. Yeah, and we are aware that this would be a very challenging task to do so, just because of the data avail availability and the complexity of <laughs> the processes there. And Kelly, I think you're also on the talk. Maybe you can comment on this a little bit more. He was there earlier. Kelly, are you with us? I guess not. Um, other call or other questions from the callers? Anyone else? Yes, we have a question here from Isabel Filiberto, and she, I'll read it out loud. She said, I would like to ask the presenter of the binational nature of the basin in terms of management platform slash decisions, if they're taken into account in this scenario. Uh, regarding the new strategies, land use, and water use. Okay, so do you want to answer? Uh, yes, so um, uh, the data we use to represent the act of strategies are uh, based on the interviews, and uh, so the anthropologist team uh, conducted interview in the two countries, so um, U.S. and Mexico, and uh, what we want here is to uh, integrate uh, different behavior uh, among the regions. So the farmers in the San Luis Valley in uh, Colorado, they won't have the same behavior of the farmers in uh, Rio Contra, for example. So yes, we will integrate uh, different behavior in the, uh, according to the location in the basin. This is not only between the countries, but so, uh, inside the same country. Uh, caller, did that uh, answer your question? If you're not actively asking a question, please uh, mute yourself. We're getting some feedback. So, um, 
Other questions? Yes, we have one more from Steve. And his question is, what is the most current stream gauge data for the Rio Grande you have been able to use, particularly in Mexico? Most recent stream gauge data in Mexico? Okay, so I have the same problem, actually. <laughs> uh, so, okay. Uh, so I didn't uh, include the details here. Uh, but I'm also interested by that because we have a detailed uh, historic data for the gauges uh, from USGS uh, for the Rio Grande and the tributaries of the Rio Grande. Uh, we have a dat daily data uh, along uh, the border from IBWC, so for the Rio Grande. However, uh, I'm still looking for data also. Uh, daily data of uh, gauges in Mexico. And I don't have the answer to this question, so if someone knows, uh, I will be very happy uh, to know where I can get this data. So do you have any hydrologic flow or, or gauge data from Mexico? I, no, right now, no. Okay. Just uh, the ABWC, so this is the, uh, along the border, the Rio Grande, but for the for the tributaries, uh, we have at the confluence with the Rio Grande because it's uh, recorded by ABWC, but we don't have along the tributaries. So if anyone on the line knows of a source of that data, please send it along to the email addresses that are listed in the last slide, and we'll, we'll flip up to those in a few minutes so you can see those um, again. We'd be very interested in having that, that information. So. I think I saw another question come in. Is that right, Sarah? Can you read it to us? So this is the next question um, to, for Sophie. Considering in the test of the model the amount of water needed to maintain some of the hydrological and ecological processes in a medium or long term inside the basin. Uh, so it will be, um, uh, it will be a scenario we will uh, we will uh, model, but uh, yes, of course, uh, we want to include that also in the model, representing uh, environmental flow and uh, see the impact um, on the stream flow and uh, also on the land use, because the thing is. Uh, we, are, we have an over-allocation of water in this basin, so if we increase the stream flow for environmental purpose, um, some other uh, user of water will have to lease this uh, flow, uh, so we want to represent that in the model. Yeah, and so that was definitely on our list of interesting indicators. And that also came up in that concept mapping exercise, that this is something that people in the basin are very interested in. Other Thank questions? you. I, I have one more question. Um, this one, uh, if you could explain a little bit more um, on the uncertainty of the model. <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> So, um, obviously, we're covering a large area in low spatial detail, but we apply the coupled human and natural systems framework, and uh, the framework itself is geared towards understanding different scales of processes in systems, and especially in the relationship between different subsystems. So what we're aiming at with our research is not to provide the best possible, very detailed modeling or simulation of the subsystems, but to understand how the different components are related and affect each other. And that's the focus of our research. And just given the spatial extent of the study area, of course, we have high uncertainty in our simulation results, but by having this, um, well, relatively intense collaboration. We also hope to, at some point, include more stakeholders, uh, present our simulation results to stakeholders to make sure that we get the trends correct. And that's what we're mainly interested in. 
to be able to understand trends at the basin-wide scale to learn more about the relationships of the subsystem. And I know that's uh, not a very um, like engineering biophysical answer to that question, but that is also not what this research is about. Other questions? Do you have some other questions? These have been excellent questions. I have a question. That area near the mouth that was outside the watershed, but you chose to include it because it withdraws a lot of water, consumes a lot of water um, for irrigation. Um, what was your source of information on the amount of water? Are there good records kept? Uh, so for the counties, uh, we use the data from USGS. Uh, so, so it's a gauge of some sort, or is it what they're reporting as far as water being concerned? So the methodology USGS used to uh, assess the water uh, we draw, I don't know, but this is the county <coughs> that uh, we have uh, the conception per uh, sector, so per agriculture or for okay. domestic purposes. And also, in, from a coupled human natural systems point of view, that is currently a very important research topic to identify the system boundaries that include both, like the social system component and also the ecological system component. And just from our collaboration, we felt that this is such an important topic that we have to include it in our simulation model. That's why we made that decision to include these three counties. Seems like a good decision. I, I think I would have made the same decision. Okay, we've got uh, three minutes left. Any other questions? Oh, not just a comment, Matt. Uh, I will send the uh, data name uh, about the hydrology of, for the Rio Concho Basin to Sophie. Don't worry about it. This uh, data, a specific database that I don't remember right now, but I will send it to her and buy buy that database or uh, or just get it. Somewhere. Thank you, Alfredo. That would be most helpful. Thank you very much, <laughs> Alfredo. It's all right. Okay. If you have any further questions, I suggest that you send them to Sophie or Jennifer at the email addresses listed on the um, on the screen there. And so unless there's any other questions, we're going to end the call. Any other questions? Thank you all for joining us. We appreciate the folks at the World Wildlife Fund, the folks at Coca-Cola, and our um, and all of uh, the folks who called in today. Thank you very much for participating. And with that, we'll conclude the call. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.